So, first of all, I want to say that I'm really, really pleased that Professor Dave Lenz has accepted our invitation this morning. Some of you will remember him from the annual scientific meeting uh, back in Leicester when we were talking about taking AHPs to do diploma. And we've moved on now, as you know, and have the AHPs going to be taking membership. So David was truly the most appropriate person to have today. Um, he's Professor of, and I always have to read this, Sexualities and Genders, Health and Wellbeing at the University of Greenwich. And he's got a very big interest in nurses' postgraduate education. So, David, I'm sure, will introduce himself more. And I'll hand over to you, David. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks, Gillian. Let me just share my screen with you all then, if I may. Okay, well this is a really truly fantastic honour to be here with you all because after that event in um, uh, 2014 at Leicester, loads of things have happened and I want to say it's all down to you lot. You really are the Midas touch, the gold touch here because after I did that presentation in, uh, um, it, I think it was springtime of 2014 and what I was asked to look at then was whether nurses physiotherapists and other um, appropriately qualified allied health professionals could actually do your courses, your examinations, get the certification and maybe anything more. And in fact, from what Gillian tells me, you've gone so much further than that now. So not just the fact of being able to do the diploma and get the qualification, but even to uh, work towards membership as well. So that's fantastic. But the very fact that you asked me to do that presentation there, when I said you've got the Midas touch, it's because not long after that was when I was appointed as a National Teaching Fellow. So um, there were about 50 of us that year, there's only about 900 across the whole country and it's um, the UK's highest award for teaching excellence at universities. So thank you very much. You know, that's what I got straight after you and loads of other things since. It's been really good to be able to look at the way that medical organisations can start looking broader with their recruitment for education. And especially because there is this sort of flip-flopping with um, professional organisations in universities, which I'll explain later, uh, will be great if we can do some more collaborative work. So it was wonderful uh, that you asked me to do that. And on the back of doing that presentation, I was then asked to write it up uh, for your journal. So the, the whole presentation is actually backed up there as well. If you're not sure about this program I'm using, this is Prezi. And I just said to Katie that the first time I used it, somebody told me it's like, um, it's like PowerPoint on speed. OK, so this is where we're moving to next. The interprofessional health education um, Hopefully you're aware that there are lots of different conferences around on interprofessional education and sometimes it's called interprofessional health education. So this whole field of practice is getting much, much wider now and it is enabling people to move from out, outside of silos that they had worked in in the past. And you join a whole list of other medical organisations that are doing similar things. So BASH with their STI foundation programmes, they came to us um, a few years ago to get their intermediate course uh, credit rated. So that means when people were doing the intermediate course, if they wanted academic credit from a university, they could do an extra assignment and then they were granted those academic credits. So BASH had been doing a lot of work around that and I'm still in contact um, with um, uh, Dr. Nick Theobald and we are doing some more collaborative work there. But also the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health, with their qualification, the, the, um, the diploma, the DFSRH, they renewed their curriculum last year. But the curriculum before that, so I'll call that the pre-2021, I've now managed to get um, tariffed. It's a little word that's not often mentioned at university, but I found out it existed. And what that means is we used to run a contraception course and we no longer run it. But the faculty have got their gold standard 
uh, diploma, which is required now for nurses working um, in any sort of contraception service. So I managed to go to our university and say, look, the faculty are now running it. We'll never run it again, but it's equal to what we used to run. So can we give people credit? So at no cost to them at all, if anybody wants to come and do um, various programmes of learning with us, and if sexual health is a relevant element, uh, element of that, they can say, well, I've got the diploma from the faculty and we'll then say at no cost to you, that's equal to 30 credits at level six. So that's what this term tariffing means. And I'll come back to the little a uh, little bit later on. But also some massive new developments as well with the um, the, the worshipful apocathries with their diploma in GU medicine. They're now considering opening that up to nurses as well. And that's going to be mind shattering because it means that nurses will have to go to our own regulatory body, the Nursing and Midwifery Council, and say, look, we've got a medical qual qualification. How does the NMC actually deal with nurses who have got medical qualifications. So some great movement going on there as well. Also with the British HIV Association and the National HIV Nursing Association, they're doing lots of collaborative elements as well. So not just for physicians, but bringing in nurses and allied health professions as well. So really what you're doing is crossing so many boundaries and the other organisations have gone down exactly the same route that you have. It's not just admitting nurses to do their training courses, but allowing them to sit the exams, to get exactly the same qualification and now, like yourselves, allowing some people going for membership as well. And um, I posted an, uh, an article to Katie last night called this one, Getting the Right Medical Students, Nature versus Nurture. So hopefully Katie will make that available to you all. And in a way, you're doing that as an organisation. You're not just looking at people, right, because you've got such and such a qualification, you can now do our courses. You're looking at who's got um, really great uh, um, uh, appetite to do your professional qualification and who's got the skills and abilities to do it. So it's not just a person's professional background, but have they got what you're looking for to be able to do this? Another one is it's helping you move out of the silos. And I don't know if any of you have read the, the Shape of Training report by Professor Sir David Greenaway on medical education. And in here he's saying, especially when people are moving across disciplines or moving within dis different elements of disciplines, how they can actually take, it's like a passport really, you've done so much learning in the past, let's build on that. So that's really a multi-potentialite approach to this. It's let's build on all of these things. Sadly, in nursing, it, all, uh, it hasn't always been like that. So in the Greenaway report, he was saying that even when people get to the status of medical consultant in their speciality, if they want to cross train to do something else, the funding should be available for them. They shouldn't lose their consultant salaries. They should be able to move sideways, do whatever um, learning it takes, even if that means doing um, a research or professional doctorate. So all of that should be available to them. Sadly, that's not the case with nurses. And there are two big strands going on here. One is with professional organisations, so like yourselves, you require your graduates to have your qualification. And that's just as it should be. But within nursing, there's also an, uh, an impetus to, to, to go higher with, um, with academic qualifications as well. So if nurses have specific um, titles like advanced nurse practitioner or um, um, <coughs> clinical nurse specialist, all of these different titles, and sometimes there's confusion about them, but with all of the different titles, what should they have to prove that they've got the learning appropriate to that? So certainly with a lot of the advanced roles, they are expected to have at least a master's degree there. But if they want to go and do all of this studying, usually it means they have to take a salary drop, they have to go back to basics, they may be on a totally different grade, or if they're paying on the one hand for professional organisation qualifications, then they may have to go to university and pay for it there. So Lord Willis was saying, it 
it would be wonderful if organisations like Health Education England would make that funding available. So really, this is, to me, it's like a case of the haves and the have-nots. Read the Greenaway report and see that money should be no object for education. Look at it from a nursing perspective with Lord Willis and it's saying, isn't it lovely what the physicians have got? Wouldn't it be great if you nurses could have the same? So very, very different ball games going on there. And where we come in from the point of view of higher education, we've got some really good uh, innovations going on. There, there is, on the one hand, something called credit for learning, and that's what I mentioned in relation to BASH. So it's when particular organisations say, well, we've got an educational course, we've written it to map across at your academic levels, maybe graduate level, level six, or postgraduate level seven. So we've done that. How do we get credit for it? Now, universities normally charge a fair bit of money for that. So when BASH came to us, they had to pay for that. And lots of your medical organisations are charities. So you haven't got the money to start off with. That's a big problem there from that point of view. But that's what credit for learning means. So supposing your diploma um, as an organisation, if you came to Greenwich and said, right, how many academic credits and what level can we get for this? We'd look at doing it, um, especially at level seven, so postgraduate level, and one academic credit is worth 10 hours of learning. So most of our courses, for example, um, most of our courses would be 15, 20, 30 or 40 credits. So say a 30 credit module is the equivalent of 300 hours. Now that doesn't mean 300 hours of contact time with whoever's providing the teaching. It could be really small. It might be about sort of 40 hours. But then on top of that, there's the self-directed learning, there's studying for the assignments, if there's any clinical elements, all that gets taken in. So that's what boosts up all of those hours. So that's what credit for learning means. The other one, the recognition of prior learning, means that somebody might have done something. Um, Gillian and I were talking earlier about the old ENB courses. So the contraception one used to be called the Family Planning Certificate. That one was the ENB 901. So if somebody was to come to me now and say, David, look, I've got the ENB 901, can I use that? Well, that's really old now. Normally, we only look back about the last five years. But if they say, well, I did the ENB 901 15 years ago, but I've always worked in contraceptive services ever since, and now I'm a clinical nurse specialist in it, then it shows that they're keeping their learning live. So that's a completely different ball game. So we might just be able to say, yes, we recognize the learning you've done there. So it could be, um, they've got a certificate for something, so it's recognition of certified learning, or they may say, well, actually, I've been working in a field of practice for so long, I've got tons and tons of experiential learning. So what they might have to do is to write a portfolio. So they sign up for a portfolio course and they produce a portfolio of evidence showing they know what they say they know. So there are lots of different ways of thinking about accrediting people's learning. I'll come back to the enhanced practice in a moment because the next one I want to mention to you is the advanced clinical practice. Now that's a formal term used by Health Education England. So we used to have a master's degree called an MSc in advanced practice. And technically somebody could finish their bachelor degree and sign up straight away for a master's degree. And they come out with a master's degree in advanced practice. But HEE has brought in this whole new concept now. They're calling the qualifications advanced clinical practice and they're open to multi-professions. So you may get um, a pharmacist doing it, uh, nurses, counsellors, loads of different people. And then HEE will have a register of people who are called advanced clinical practitioners. So it's a formal title now, and you can get that title by doing a specific course. So at Greenwich, we now do this. But where there's a little bit of a problem, HEE said you can't have people just finishing their bachelor degree and going straight on to do this. They have to show some level of developmental learning before they go on to advanced clinical practice. And that's where this whole notion of enhanced practice has come in. So HEE are now using this term, the token of enhanced practice. And again, I'll come back to that in a, in a little moment because it really fits in well for all of you here.
And then finally, what about those wanting to go beyond masters? And somebody called Evans, me, back in 2001 in the RCN sexual health strategy, I actually said in that document that whenever we're looking at any nurses working at uh, an advanced level, call them clinical nurse specialists, whatever the titles are, they should be at least considering getting a master's degree. And for those working at consultant level, master's degree definitely, maybe even uh, research, professional or clinical doctorates. And so many um, consultant nurses now are going for different types of doctorates. So lots of them have got those already or working towards them. So that's how we can map across from your education, from professional organisations and to higher education. Does anybody want to say anything or ask any questions now? No? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Right, so where to go next? Um, uh, Julia was saying earlier about the number of people that get lots of, uh, the number of nurses, they get lots of little qualifications. And it was a very hit and miss approach to uh, CPD in the past. Uh, lots of universities have all these different short courses. So it could be the mentorship course, um, or an accident emergency course or critical care course. So lots of different CPD opportunities for people. But again, where there's the problem is if nurses can't afford to pay for the university uh, modules themselves, if they're not getting time off from their employers to do it, or if they're expected to do professional courses, so say for example doing your uh, diploma, and they might say, well I've only got a limited uh, budget for all of this, I can only do one or the other. And the other problem with the traditional approach to CPD is that sometimes nurses would just collect loads of courses, and especially with nurses um, all exiting with a degree now, you might find that some of them are still choosing to do level six courses. Rather than do the next one up and go on to level seven, some of them might say, oh, maybe I'm not ready for that yet, but I know I can get through level six because I've got my bachelor degree, so I'll do it at level six. Well, I would say that's probably a waste of all these different credits because when they do sign up for different types of um, uh, degrees, like a master's degree, you can only bring in a certain number of level six credits. So it's just a waste of time and money for them to keep on repeating level six all the time. <coughs> Excuse me. So that enhanced practice, and these are the four things I want to talk to you about here then. This is what we offer from Greenwich, <coughs> but obviously all other universities will have their own approach to this. These are the things um, I'd like us to talk about here. So from the point of CPD, as I mentioned, we've got tons of CPD courses, all different types of things. And the way that people can find out and check our courses is on this website here, applycpd.com slash GRE. So lots of universities are all using this WOSAD system now, okay, the Apply CPD. So there are tons of different courses that we do. One that may be relevant to yourselves is that first one I've listed, the Enhanced Clinical Assessment Skills. Because when nurses do um, various prescribing modules, if they want to do the fullest one, the independent prescriber, the NMC often requires them to have 60 credits. Now we offer it as a 40 credit course, but we expect them to have done the Advanced Clinical Assessment beforehand. And the Advanced Clinical Assessment is an holistic assessment of people. So when you're looking at your diploma and you are assessing people holistically, it's not just you're looking at one particular area. Maybe that's going to map across to what we teach on that in, um, enhanced clinical assessment course. So it might mean, and I'm only saying this off the top of my head, it might mean if somebody has done your diploma and then wanted to do the 40 credit independent prescribing, your diploma could count towards those credits so that they could then be accepted by the Nursing and Midwifery Council as being independent prescribers. So that's the way to get all of these things to dovetail together. But we've got so many other courses, some of them may be generic, such as um, the mentorship, which has now gone over to an education module. Um, you've got that type of thing, or maybe it is in sort of critical care 
or accident and emergency care. And sometimes the national medical organisations will have come out with specific rules. So they might say, right, for, for us to call someone a specialist, they need at least 60 credits at level seven. So some of our modules are standalone, just choose, pick and mix, whatever you want. Others may be, well, these are the requirements for a particular medical organisation or nursing organisation. And I mentioned earlier about the, the portfolio of evidence, and that's great for people that say, well, I've been working in the field of practice so long, I didn't actually do qualifications in it, but because I've been working in it so long, I've worked up the scales, and I'm now the advanced clinical practitioner, or um, a, a, um, clinical nurse specialist in this, but I didn't do any qualifications for it. So they can do a sort of retrospective um, accreditation of their prior experiential learning. OK, so that's one set. Now, within sexual health, we used to have a lot more modules, um, but now this is what we're offering. So the sexual health skills is a broad foundation. And quite often it may be people who are um, school nurses, practice nurses. Anyone that's got an interest in dimensions of sexual health would do this as a core foundation. Then we've got the diploma from the, the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health, which we tariff, that I mentioned earlier. So we're no longer running a contraception course, but if anyone comes to us with their DFSRH, we can say, OK, you've got the equivalent of 30 credits at level six. Then we've got some other courses, and the, or the, the other three are at level six and level seven. So if anyone has got a degree, then I would encourage them to do this at level seven. Some nurses who qualified pre-degree status have still got the old diploma in higher education, so they get what's called a top-up degree. So they just need to work towards 120 credits at level six. So they might choose to do these modules at level six, and that's how they get their bachelor degree. In fact, there's one person that's a very good friend of Leila Frodsham, and she has had uh, dealings with you in, as an organisation. She's now completing her bachelor degree and her top-up master's. I'll come on to the master's in a moment. And that's really unique that, that she, hopefully this year she's going to graduate with both those qualifications. Only because of what happened with COVID, she couldn't complete the bachelor degree last year. So it's a unique situation. She'll be graduating with a bachelor degree and a master's degree in the same ceremony. But I'll come back on to those. So yeah, these are the two different types of uh, modules. So that top-up degree I'm talking about, and the person that you see here, I'll come back to her a little bit later on. So um, I actually lead this course. It's a top-up MA in healthcare practice. So for anyone who's got a postgraduate diploma, so that one nurse I mentioned who's now doing the top-up degree, she's got a postgraduate diploma in um, sonography. So there, she's got 120 credits. So either you need a postgraduate diploma or the equivalent of 120 credits at level seven. And with that, a full master's degree is 180 credits. So that's why this is a top up. So this may be of interest to yourselves as well. So for nurses that do have different amounts of uh, credits, they may only need a small amount more to top it up to a full master's degree. I was going to say they were the actual modules. So everyone does a core module in research methods um, and then they can do a project and dissertation. But I'll show you those right at the end of this presentation as well. So the other master's degree we've got is this one approved by Health Education England. And this is the one called Advanced Clinical Practitioner. Um, and there are three different ways of doing this. Some of them are going to be tra traditional students signing up for an MSc. So they sign up, and as far as I'm aware, Health Education England has been putting money into this to support this. Okay, So someone might say, well, I've got a bachelor degree, I've done some qualifications, say, for example, your own diploma. So they can show they've done some enhanced learning, and now they want to sign up for this MSc and it's multi-professional and it lasts for three years, okay? Only from this year onwards now, HEE has also approved um, apprenticeship standards as well. So we've got some people who are already working in, in areas of practice who then get like day release to go to university and to do it that way around. So either somebody doing it as a traditional student route or the apprenticeship. And HEE has now approved some universities of which we're one 
to do it through portfolio recognition. So if somebody turns around and says, well, I've actually been working as an advanced clinical practitioner before HEE ever invented this term, I've been doing this for the last 15 years or so, but haven't got a qualification in it, then rather than do the master's degree, they can do a portfolio of evidence mapping across to the MS, uh, MSC and Health Education England can then approve them and register them as advanced clinical practitioners. And what HEE is really keen on with the whole notion of advanced practice are these four areas here. So there must be elements of clinical practice and that's why they need to do the enhanced experience first. So they have to show that they are working at a senior level to get clinical practice at that level. They also need to be working around leadership and management, now exploring more research methods and how to uh, um, do research or participate in research, and they need an educational role as well. So HEE says that any programme they validate has to have an equal amount of all of these four. And that's where Bridging the Gap comes in, because only last month we validated a brand new postgrad diploma that we're calling Enhanced Professional Practice. And although the advanced uh, uh, PG diploma would normally be two years, what we're saying is it's just one year direct entry to year two, because the equivalent of the first year is what we're already accepting from people from what they've done. So if nurses or others come along to us and say, well, I've got 60 credits at level seven already, or I've done the diploma course uh, with the IPM, what's that worth? So we look at all of that, and as long as they've got 60 credits, to start off with, we'll uh, no charge to them at all. We say, right, you've got your first year done. So basically, this is a one-year programme that we're running because we're accepting the first year as already completed with the credit points they bring in with them. So for year two, it's exactly the same research methods course as I do on the top of MA and the MSc. And then they've got some options. So they can either do the leadership and management or that independent prescribing, but if they do that, as I say, for nurses, they would have to evidence at least 20 other credits of holistic assessment for them to be recognised by the NMC. Another way around this is uh, um, uh, their work-based learning portfolio. So this may be of interest to some of your uh, professionals who are doing this. They may say, right, well, I'll bring this in. I'll write up a portfolio and spend you know, 400 hours for this. There's the 40 credits. Okay, that's an option. And then next year, hopefully, we're bringing in a teaching qualification as well. So if somebody says, well, I want to get into teaching either clinically or maybe move to universities. So we're looking at bringing in 40 credits here. And with some of our courses, we map across to um, the Higher Education Academy. So they would come out with a teaching qualification, which is the fellowship of the Higher Education Academy. So we're hoping, fingers crossed, we're hoping that that's going to happen uh, for next year. OK, so there's gathering loads of points or building them together, either moving on to the top of MA or the MSc, and then um, our new diploma will help them to bridge that gap. And with that year of the diploma they do, it's identical to, the, to, to, um, to year two of the MSc. So if somebody does our postgrad diploma, they can either carry on and do the top of MA for just another 60 credits, or if they want to do the MSc advanced clinical practice, they move sideways onto that and they just have to do year one and year three because year two is identical to the PG dip. So again, it's saving them time and money by doing it through different routes. OK, and especially as that first year isn't going to cost them anything at all other than what they've paid to do those courses um, wherever they've done them. And that doesn't have to be with us. And here's the final bit of it now. So with the level sevenness of all this, so sometimes nurses will say, well, yeah, I finished my bachelor degree, but what's the difference then with level seven? Does it mean I just have to study harder? So I've produced loads of stuff around the level sevenness, which I've sent to Katie for you, uh, looking at the difference, even when we use terms like critical analysis, how do you understand that differently from level six to level seven? So it's looking at that, but the huge emphasis with level seven is they should be now leading. 
So whereas their bachelor degree in nursing qualified them to give uh, really good care to individual clients or small groups of clients, by the time they move to level seven, they should be helping to influence practice, lead practice, educate in practice, and that means getting themselves out there, being, being able to disseminate. So one of the modules I run is called the Dynamics of Dissemination, Publishing, promoting and performing your studies. But I would say that underpins all level seven qualifications. It's not just they're doing a master's degree for their own benefit, but they should be impacting others, whether that's influencing their trust boards or teaching others, they should be the ones leading now. And when it comes to the different uh, uh, master's projects, the dissertations that they do, that's the three things on the right hand side of your screen. So I'll just quickly go into those. They might choose to do a clinical audit or service evaluation. And the big difference that we use there in the terminology is they call it an audit if there's a national gold standard to map up against. So supposing there's a nice guideline on a particular thing. Maybe it's a service delivery or a clinical situation. So they want to map against the gold standard of the NICE guideline. So that's when we would call it a clinical audit. If no such um, document exists, then what they're doing is simply evaluating their service just to map out where it is. So that's one type of project. So they normally do the project and then they write it up as a 10,000 word dissertation. Okay, so that's the one type. The other one is the work-based uh, work change management. And that's when somebody may say, well, I've got a gut feeling that we could be doing things better. And because I know so well that we should be doing it better, I don't want to spend all my time doing an evaluation to prove it because I know that. So the service evaluation may only be one small element of this, but what they actually have to do then is look at different models of um, change management theory and see which ones are going to work best with this because how can I get my service from this position over to that position? And the person I want to mention here uh, Kay Elmy, she was one of our master's graduates a few years ago, and in 2012, she won the UK Sexual Health Awards for um, Sexual Health Professional of the Year. And that was based on the work that she was doing around her master's dissertation. She was the senior nurse in a sexual assault referral centre, and her trust were going to merge that centre with the local GU service and she had to take responsibility for merging these two together. And she wanted to work out, would it just mean that two separate services happen to be under one roof? Or can you actually integrate, maybe dual train everyone there, so that they can all work across both services? And that's what she was actually exploring. But a difficulty she found was in the Sexual Assault Referral Centre, um, they used to have paper-based questionnaires. And one of the questions was, um, have you ever been the victim of domestic violence or intimate partner violence? And she said when she was showing that paper-based work to the, to the GU nurses, some of them said, look, we're completely out of our depth here. How can we ask that question? Because if a person says yes, we don't know what to do about it then. So the nurses were making a sub subjective um, judgment on clients. They'd be looking at the patients and thinking, I wonder if you look like a victim. Now, what does a victim look like? You know, right, what? Do, um, they were making a, a, a judgment on this. So they would ask the question of some people, but not necessarily of everyone. But when the two services merged, they went over to electronic uh, notes and the page couldn't be turned unless that question was answered. And so many of the nurses and the other professions were saying, we don't know what to do. If a person says yes, how do we even refer them? How do we respond to them? We're not sure what we do. So what Kate had to do then, um, okay, what Kay had to do was actually to look at ways of skilling them all up educating them all so they were all on a level playing field here so that whoever came through the door if a person said yes i have been the victim of domestic violence or abuse then they would all know what to do next 
and that's how she won that award, but it's what she wrote up as her master's degree. So uh, as I say, these are not just doing qualifications for the sake of doing them, but they've got real patient benefit, real client benefit. And the final one that some of them do, in fact, last year because of COVID, most of them are doing it this way, even though some of them had wanted to do work-based change projects, they all had to end up doing um, extended literature review. But this is really great, especially for those that want to go on and do doctoral studies. So whether they're going to do um, PhD, so a doctorate by research, clinical doctorates or professional doctorates, whichever they want to go on to, they might want to do an extended literature review just to map the terrain, to see, well, is there enough out there for me actually to spend time doing a doctorate on? Okay, so that's really, really important. It gives them an opportunity to scope the literature out of which they can then build a research proposal to go on and do a doctorate. And that's it. Okay, so I've covered all the stuff I wanted to with you. These are some of the references and I've sent some of this stuff um, already uh, on to you. So you'll be able to have a look at those as and when you want. So it's now over to yourselves. Any questions? And especially around what I've written on that screen there.